Uh, thank you so much for, for sticking around with us. Uh, so um, again, my name's uh, Joey, and I work at the Center for Science and the Imagination, and I'm going to introduce our two special guests tonight. So to my immediate right, or to you know, where you're looking, looks at my left from here, to my right uh, is Alberto Rios. Uh, he is a Regents Professor in ASU's Department of English and the director of the Virginia G. Piper Center for Creative Writing. He's the author of 10 books, I don't know if this is up to date now, but 10 books and chapbooks of poetry, three collections of short stories, and a memoir. He has won several armfuls of awards, as I learned when putting together your bio, uh, including the Western Literature Association Distinguished Achievement Award, the Arizona Governor's Arts Award, fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts, the Walt Whitman Award, the Western States Book Award for Fiction, six Pushcart Prizes in both poetry and fiction, and inclusion in the Norton Anthology of Modern Poetry, along with hundreds of other national and international anthologies. He holds the Catherine C. Turner Endowed Chair in English here at ASU, and uh, was named the State of Arizona's first Poet Laureate in 2013, and he was elected to the Board of Chancellors of the Academy of American Poets in 2014. All right, no big deal. All right. Uh, and to my further right, Kevin Sandler is an associate professor and director of ASU's Film and Media Studies program, which I graduated from, and director of our master's degree program in American media and popular culture. He specializes in the contemporary U.S. media business with a particular focus on censorship and animation. He is the co-editor of the collection Titanic, Anatomy of a Blockbuster, and editor of Reading the Rabbit, Explorations in Warner Brothers Animation. His upcoming book is about the history, artistry, and business of Scooby-Doo from Duke University Press. <laughs> Hotly awaited. I'm very excited about this book. When's it coming out? As soon as you finish writing it, right? 2020. 2020. We're, get ready for a Scooby-Doo event. I'm calling it right now. All right. Um, okay. So uh, we're going to talk for 20 or so minutes up here, a little more maybe, and then we'll take some questions. Um, so. Uh, Alberto, I want to start with you. It's, it's your history with Huckleberry Hound specifically, but with all these cartoons more generally that inspired us to do this event in the first place. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I have a funny story about Huckleberry Hound and how close he is to, to my growing up. I grew up in Nogales on the border. Some of you may have been there. Um, and in 1960, I was a charter member of the Huckleberry Hound Club. <laughs> I had, for however, whatever methodology I had, I had gathered up a, I believe it was a dime and enough cereal box tops to send off to become a member of this, you know, club, which they had advertised on the show and was on the back of the cereal, and I was all excited about it. So I sent off, and about two months later, I got something that changed my life. And it started with the container, believe it or not. It was the first time. I got an 8x10 manila envelope. And it almost doesn't matter what was in it. If you're a kid, it was the first piece of mail that I got that was big, that had my name on it, and that my parents didn't open up first. <laughs> so I got this. You know, I, I held it reverentially and uh, turned it around. There seemed to be something rattling around in it. I finally I took it to my bedroom. My brother was there. I'm shaking it up, and, and then finally I, I very carefully open it up, and I shake something out, and it's wonderful, wonderful, really cheap tin signet ring with Huckleberry Hound on it. It's like the best thing you could get, right? It was just, it was wonderful. A little flattened out in the mail, but it was great. You could move it around. And then inside that envelope, there were eight by 10 color glossies of Huck and the gang. Huck and Yogi, Quick Draw McGraw. As I reached in, I pulled out the first one and I got the great shock of my life. It was Huckleberry Hound and he was blue. 1960 on the border. I had a black and white television. Even though I loved Huckleberry Hound, it never occurred to me that he was blue. Had I grown up in the South, had I ever eaten a Huckleberry, I might have had a clue that this could have been blue. But in fact, when I did that, it was me inventing the color blue 
for myself in that moment. I remember to this day. You can read definitions of words in the dictionary, but that's all they are. You've got to make that dictionary for yourself. That moment was the color blue, me defining it for myself, but beyond the color blue. Growing up where I did, how I did, on the border, understanding that now I could look at Huckleberry Hound in a way so different than how I had seen him all those times I had seen the program made me think that if he looked different, maybe other things did too. Maybe it wasn't just Huckleberry Hound who had more to offer. And I think for me as a writer, it was the opening up of something. I didn't go around articulating that. You're just a little kid. But it made me think that there was more. So, yeah, I think, I mean, obviously that was me hearing that story and, and, and Kevin and I talking with Alberto, that was the moment where we were like, well, we have to, you know, we have to do this event. And uh, you want to show the slides? Yeah, I do. Uh, <laughs> we actually have something to throw up on the screen for you, actually. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that was it, man, that was it. <laughs> that was it, absolutely. Okay, that whole, was the ring. Yeah, it's that the whole kit. The okay. <laughs> yeah, we don't we don't have the uh, the glossies <laughs> out there, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know I did manage to pick up. Uh, oh. <laughs> a Huckleberry Hound. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's the same. Oh my you know, God. With a, still has a little bit of color. Oh. So, so this whoa, is for you. Oh. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, thank you. <laughs> all right, all right. I was there. <laughs> That's beautiful. Oh, yeah, one of the you. things about just about color in Hanna Barbera and why Hanna Barbera managed to <laughs> become the most dominant animation studio at the time in the early 60s in the world in terms of the amount of product that it was pushing out was that they had the foresight, unlike some of its competitors at the time. Uh, to produce everything in uh, color, even though most, uh, mostly everything uh, was uh, being broadcast in, uh, in, in black and white uh, for the next uh, few years. So when things went into Saturday morning, when things went into after school, and the whole color craze uh, started, uh, that they were there and they could sell their stuff uh, to whatever station that wanted it, and thus become ingrained in many people's minds for the next 15, 20 years or so. Were these shows, I mean, was, was Huckleberry Hound, I guess, in the club, was that a kind of early pioneer in, in building a community and sort of fandom that went beyond the, the show to other media and toys and other stories, the way we see kind of all entertainment working now? Is that, well, is that new at, in, in the 60s? Well, uh, Huckleberry Hound came out in 58, and certainly there was one other club in which it's based on that became really big, Mickey Mouse Club. Sure. Yeah. And so they were just trying to um, you know, pick up on that. And, and, and they had originally thought that Huckleberry Hound was just going to be for kids, and this was you know, kind of the, the, the first uh, a, a way of just kind of you know, building uh, you know, kind of their, uh, you know, the, the, you know kind of, probably making a little bit of extra money on the part of Hannah uh, Anna Barbera, but what they didn't know is that Huckleberry Hound really started to appeal to college students and adults, and college students were having screenings uh, all over the place, and you know there was uh, mascots with ha uh, Huckleberry Hound. Uh, there was a lot of places, and so he kind of tapped into uh, you know the college generation at the time, his attitude of you know of things happening to him and and keeping a smile on his face despite insurmountable, insurmountable odds. And so you had, and, and so this is one of those unique things in which a show that really was designed for kids because the other shows were prime time. Uh, but this show, sponsored by Kellogg's, uh, was syndicated. Uh, and so it could appear any time after school until maybe 7, 7.30, depending on your market, uh, while the Flintstones and Beanie and Caesar were both primetime shows. Uh, one sponsored by, uh, not, not, not the, the Jetsons and Beanie were both primetime shows. And particularly with Beanie and Caesar sponsored by Mattel. 
Uh, so uh, that was kind of a, a unique uh, kind of thing about Huckleberry Hound that uh, for its time in terms of this dual appeal to both adults and kids. It seems significant that they would, you know, be able to, they would emulate the Mickey Mouse Club and, and kind of prove that that model could work, not just for Mickey Mouse, right? Which feels like kind of a distinctive and unique figure in American culture. I, I think that's, you know, to me that seemed like looking back and, and with only a sketchy knowledge of the media history, uh, that there was kind of a through line. And today we have fan fiction, spinoffs and amusement park rides and interactive stories. And, you know, this is just one little gesture, but an example of inviting people in emotionally to, mm -hmm. to be part of the experience in some way. It's also something else was going on. We, we want to say that it was for kids and adults both, but it was for smart kids who wanted to say something about the world. It gave them a way to do that. Uh, the commentary, if you're a kid, it gave you a voice that later became something like Mystery Science Theater 3000, or you were saying something about the world each time you saw this. And so all of these little comments, yeah. that, that, uh, that Beanie and Cecil thing eviscerates Disneyland. I mean, it's just got everything everywhere. And if you're a kid, you're connecting it, and you're going, yeah, yeah. You know, I could have thought of that, sort of, or I get it. And you're, you're in on something, and it's different from being the adult that later would come along. You're in on it as a kid, and therefore you share that voice that is different. It's under or around or on top of Disneyland and other things. And uh, I, I, I think that felt powerful. I know that when I talk to friends of mine in the neighborhood, we just go over and over those in-jokes mm -hmm. because it gave us something. Right? And something like Mickey Mouse Club, it just seems so cheesy <laughs> <laughs> that, that other kids, you needed an outlet to say they're, they're, you know, there's other ways to think about the world. Um, that actually reminds me of something as we were preparing for this event and talking. Um, you talked about cartoons like this as a space of possibility, both in terms of the way they represent science and technology in kind of comprehensible terms, kind of, you know, having iconic images of things like rockets that are inestimably complex, but are kind of simplified. And there's a little on-ramp through the, through the uh, stylization. But also it sounds like maybe a sense of possibility even about like the humor and the sort of cultural capital that these characters I'll, I'll tell you, it, it, it was humor, but it was based, it was predicated on something a little bit more uh, serious, something more cultural. And uh, in so many ways, if for lack of a better word, poverty. A lot of people going through a lot of trouble uh, found in cartoons um, the world of yes, I can do this. And I remember my mother and I watching a Bugs Bunny cartoon later and we just happened to see this at the same time, where the cartoon bugs, they, they tell him something and he says, oh, I know where it is. And he goes over to a, a lake and he picks up the edge of a lake and he gets something from under it, right? My mother and I, for years, up until she passed away, would still say that to each other. Just, oh, go get it from under the lake. If you ever read the story Mama's Bank Account, right? There is no such thing, there is no such place but it's an act of faith. There's somewhere, I don't know where it is, it could be under the lake, but there's somewhere. And cartoons sort of gave you that, that sense of absolute gravitas. How could a rocket work? Well, it's like a big firecracker. We had a lot of firecrackers in Nogales. And, and then, you know that hand, he pushes the button, the hand comes up and, and lights the thing that connects the fuse. That's kid science, right? That's which later is actual the adults they're going to be. I get it, you get it, something, you, you're, you're progressing with the ideation there of the notion that something could blast off and become meaningful, right? We think of it as just colors, but in, in the cartoons it's more people or cartoon characters going up there and they're having a good time. Why not? That notion of possibility is for people especially where you're, you're struggling to make ends meet, um, cartoons fulfilled an odd and amiable function of saying, it's okay, you're, you're gonna find the answers somewhere where we don't know where they are. Maybe it's the moon where that's where you're gonna find cheese, <laughs> right? And a lot of it, but we don't like Limburger. So it's even making a commentary on that right then. But there's cheese somewhere, and you're going you're to be okay. Yeah, it's funny that you're know, talking about the smartness in Huckleberry Hound and, and some of these cartoons here, because that smartness kind of dissipated 
and died off quite quickly once we got into kind of the mid set and the mid early to mid 60s and as we move our way into Saturday morning because uh, when does Saturday morning start just for Saturday morning course. really starts in 1966 uh, with Space Ghost uh, and the big success of the Beatles the year uh, the year prior uh, not those Beatles I did I did a double take the first time you said yeah. that not, not the yellow submarine Beatles the other Beatles yeah, the other Beatles. Yeah. And, 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 and what happened in the early 60s is that what you see with Huckleberry Hound is this kind of smartness, this kind of uh, this, this, a modernism, uh, left over a little bit of modernism, the kind of self-awareness, turning to the camera, rejection of classical norms, all of these things. And definitely and, in Beanie and Cecil, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that's in Beanie and Cecil, it, it's, it's almost more overt. And then right. even in the Jetsons, I felt like there was a fair amount of winking in this episode to all these different Right, and that's, you know, 62, Beanie and Cecil, I think this one is 60. And the funny thing about the modernism in the Jetsons episode, uh, that was Bob Cannon who directed the Eep Op orc and he's the one from UPA uh, um, um, Film Studio that won a number of Academy Awards, and particularly he directed... Uh, Gerald McBoing Boing. And so they brought him in specifically for that, because even though this was the second episode of the Jetsons, it really was the first one made. There's actually a lot of money and uniqueness. There's even shadows that, that are going into that cartoon because it's, it's the one that's going to uh, gonna open the series. But with the smartness is that what happened is that Beanie and Cecil wasn't particularly popular, that the Flintstones' popularity kind of died down as it went from 1960 to 66. Top Cat was not the indisputable in leader of the gang. He's the tip, he's the top, he's the cream of the crop, he's the most tip top. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so when Top Cat failed, the Jetsons was not a success. It was up against Disney. <laughs> uh, wonderful World of Color, and it's up against Carb 54, Where Are You? Uh, and because Huckleberry Hound's popularity got eclipsed by one of the cartoons in his show, one of the cartoon characters, Yogi Bear. And Yogi Bear may be smarter than the average bear, <laughs> but he wasn't as smart as Huckleberry Hound, and the cartoons weren't as smart. And so what took over was the sense that cartoons were failing in prime time they still appeal to kids. So instead of having cartoons that would appeal to multi-generation, the you know, cartoons became kind of this a kiddie fair again. And thus, everything became, in a way, slightly dumber, more for a five-year-old, more for a seven-year-old, instead of appealing to multi-generation. And so it's, you're seeing kind of just that the heyday of this early animation period that influence the possibilities that, that Tito was talking to. But I grew up on Saturday morning and like the dumbest cartoons that you could find in the 70s that were devoid of any, of most, a lot of creativity uh, because the money wasn't there and it was only being made for kids to wake up early in the morning. So uh, it's a unique kind of experience of how he grew up with cartoons and how I did. You know, you and, and can, you can I just oh, jump please, in for just a moment? Do jump in, There's something yes. else about the smartness uh, of the cartoons. And by the way, they couldn't write Huckleberry on the side here, just Huck Hound Club. Anyway, <laughs> um, the smartness when you mentioned the Flintstones, when, when you were a kid, the Flintstones, I think they were a year apart when they debuted, uh, the Flintstones and the Jetsons gave you a dynamic range. Wherever you were standing, you could look both backward and forward. And that was different from the static notion of just being entertained or, or babysat. It, it said you could think, you could widen something regarding the horizon even of cartoons. And so the gags that were, you know, the Flintstones and the gags that were in the Jetsons, you saw a Roomba in the Jetsons and a Shredder and everything else, right? It was all there. The, the, those things helped you to think about uh, what you would later see. If I can make a, just a quick analog to uh, the second uh, football championship before it was the Super Bowl, the second one in Kansas City. I don't know how many of you saw that, but here are these hulking like Flintstone-like football players, and at halftime, they had the jetpack guy. Does anybody remember that? 
<laughs> he flew right. I never forgot it. It felt like the Jetsons had arrived in the middle of the Flintstones. But it was football. It was <laughs> a little different. But all of this gave dynamic range to, to us, I think, as kids in, in a way that was different from just sitting there and idly just watching a, a, a television show. That actually is a, a beautiful bridge to the next thing I wanted to ask, which is sort of, well, kind of getting to that question of like how this comments, how these, all of these shows, you know, if we can pick and choose, how they comment and incorporate the science, technology, and of course, like social and historical kind of currents that they were, that they were swimming in, in the sixties. Uh, you know, and, and I think because we picked a bunch of space cartoons in my mind on the space race, but uh, I mean, I'm sort of interested in what, what you all think about that, being much more familiar with these shows and sort of having grown up with them. What's the question? Oh, yeah, see, this is like classic, classic this event series, so I don't ask a question. I'm kind of interested in how you think, I guess I'm asking, how do these incorporate historical events from the time? How do oh, they incorporate the science oh. and technology of the day, especially? The so we, we, we want to think of historical events as big and neon, but so much more of how we live history is right in the middle. It, it's it's, it's the, uh, the things that, that guide your life, the things that are closer uh, to home. And, and I think when we saw, for example, Disneyland, when Disneyland opened, I think in 55 or so, it was so huge. To have this come back, I mean, you don't think of Disney opening of Disneyland maybe as a historical event, yeah. but it was. And, and it embraced the space race. That is to say, there were all sorts of things, future land and all that sort of stuff incorporated into that. So, so these, these smaller versions of historical events, I, I think later when Rocky and Bullwinkle came in, I mean, you saw it all over the place. But, but the, the commentary uh, was there all the time. It was, it was throughout uh, the things. And so many times, Beanie and Cecil is a good example. If, you, if you're listening just to the characters talk, you're hearing a little bit. But if you're reading what they're actually showing, you saw all those cheeses and you saw all of you're getting a lot more. So it was asking something of you. And I know that does not seem to present itself as, his, as an historical event, but reading and hearing and taking in from a box was the future. Yeah. Right? You know, it, it's, it, it's funny that, um, the, that Hanna-Barbera was, af after, you, after the Jetsons, you know, kind of failed. And after something like Huckleberry Hound uh, and Yogi Bear, that Hanna-Barbera was successful because they didn't do those things. Mm -hmm. That you had something, you had some of these smaller studios engaging in issues of the space race, uh, whether it is, you know, Rocky and Bullwinkle, which, you know, was, was the next larger studio. Uh, uh, but uh, you had, you know, Roger Ramjet, you had is our you know, hero. Yeah, is your smaller, hero. smaller groups. But something like Beanie and Cecil, I mean, that engaging with these con contemporary issues, you know, was not the kind of thing that was going to be playing in syndication down the line. It wasn't the kind of product that networks wanted uh, for kids uh, because per perhaps they believe, it, you know, it was going to go over their heads. But the thing about Hanna-Barbera was not only the foresight to produce things in color, but the foresight to kind of produce things that are evergreen, that are not located in a particular moment of history. And so when you think of things post Huckleberry Hound, because there's only was four primetime shows and they all went Saturday morning, and that's why they continue to be popular. They were really well written, they were really well produced, they had a lot of fluid animation. That's the Flintstones, the Jetsons, Top Cat, and Johnny Quest. But in between that period, there's a lot of these other characters that Hanna-Barbera played with that had nothing to do with this, these, this spa anything space race, anything uh, that had dealt with the beat generation. Uh, it was the Peter Potamus, the Snagglepusses, the Yogi Bears, the Sneasley and Breezleys, the... Uh, you know, Quick Draw McGraw to some extent, the Wally Gators, the Augie Dog. Alligator yeah, and even when they got the 65, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, no, please. Uh, <laughs> just drop the spotlight. You got guy. Secret <laughs> Squirrel, which really, you know, isn't, and Adam Ant, which isn't, isn't that, you know, these are kind of these kind of 
characters that have a funny voice, that maybe have a funny gadget, but are not tied to the time. Yeah. Uh, and so something like uh, Beanie and Cecil, which was on Saturday morning, you know, for you know, four or five years, getting to the late '60s, it's a show that never was in. Uh, on Saturday morning, growing up, I was born in 69, and it never was in syndication, probably because it was just owned by Clampett, not by a big conglomerate. Uh, but I never knew it existed until I got into my 20s, because it never was there, and partly having to do with because you're dealing with satire. Yeah. It's, you know, it strikes me that... It, like we're talking about sort of timeliness and timelessness, things that stuck around, but the things that are commenting on their time and just getting to the kind of the, the way that both the Flintstones, which we've been talking about and the Jetsons, which we watched uh, work with history. I mean, they are very ahistorical about certain things, right? I mean, they project really far out into the future. They project really far back into the past, but there's still this kind of, you know, middle-class nuclear family. Like there's, you know, and, and when we were talking yesterday, I, uh, I, I really thought like, there's a reassuring notion to this. I mean, this, these are turbulent times, right? This is like the height of the Cold War in some ways. But, uh, you know, here technology's radically changed. It's either devolved in, in a way. I mean, Flintstones is almost as sort of technologically innovative as the Jetsons in a way, they, you know, because of all the bizarre mousetrappy gadgets they come up with. But, you know, in the Jetsons, there's a completely different sort of techno condition for, for human beings. But our identities are the same, our values are the same, our social structures are very recognizable. And it struck me, you know, I just finished watching Altered Carbon, I don't know if any of you watched that on Netflix, and uh, The Expanse, and like Black Mirror, and the big zeitgeist for future fiction right now seems to be that technology is going to alter human society and behavior and make it unrecognizable. I mean, that's, that's like our kind of current thesis about this. In this show, you know, I don't know that these people came out and said, oh, we want to have a thesis about the future, but it, it seems like they're saying in some ways like, we're not going to stop being who we are. It doesn't matter how convenient things get. I mean, I think in a way there's a kind of like a historical flattening in the face of all this like real technological change, whether it's space or, you know, nuclear weapons or household gadgets. I don't know. And that just yeah. stri struck me. There's this whole kind of interesting tension around timeliness and history and technology. The, the political change. overlay, you can't under, understate that. Though. It was so big. Later, I, when did, when did uh, Rocky and Bullwinkle... Uh, uh, 58 and 59. 58. Boris and Natasha, right? Uh, you, you know what that, that was, which later in Mad Magazine became Spy versus Spy in, in a stylized sort of way. And, and uh, the, the issues of, of the Cold War, and you, you saw in Vinny and Cecil, the bad guy, Nya, uh, uh, right? Uh, who, who would appear over and over, and he, he would have that same snide which becomes snidely whiplash, which becomes that, that, that kind of sound who becomes Mr. Smith in Lost in Space, really, right? Becomes that, that bad, there's always a bad guy. And what did he want to start? Like Horrible Land or something. Instead of Beanie Land, I can't remember what the name of his, his land was. Dismal Land. Dismal Land. Dismal Land. <laughs> it's like, you know, that's, that was a, a commentary in the Cold War. If we let them win, it's going to be Dismal Land, you know? Yeah. And, and it, it was a current through, through everything, and it was a current through our lives as we were living it. When uh, I don't know how many of you had the, you know, the, the Cold War uh, plan where you had to get under your desk and you had these things in, in school, and, and it played into cartoons and other things. Yeah. Yeah, I think with just this Jetsons episode, and you, you guys have said beautifully, I just wanted this, of kind of the uniqueness of this episode, um, is that... You know, it, it, just like a lot of pilots, and this is really the pilot, uh, it didn't find its footing just yet of, of what it was going to be. And so there's a degree of kind of absurdity and, uh, and, and, and you know, kind of in high modernism, I would say, in, in the series that we didn't see. And that's because of not just Bob Cannon, who came from UPA, and Gerald McBoing Boing, uh, and the Telltale Heart and some of these other cartoons that that studio had made before making Mr. Magoo and then own people only wanting Mr. Magoo cartoons is who Jet Screamer is based on. And I wonder if anybody knows who's singing, who is Jet Screamer, and what character is he using? 
in basing. Is that anyone any idea? No, I've been trying to puzzle this out for like weeks. Yes. Yeah. For me. For, for the microphone, we heard Bye Bye Birdie. As well, a, that is certainly and possibly an Frankie Avalon. It's certainly an influence of the show, um, but it is, that's Howard Morris. And who is uh, Howard Morris? And Howard Morris, um, <laughs> particularly, this is his first gig, and he did Adam Ant. But Howie Morris was from Your Show is Shows. And if you, if you, after you get back and you type in with Sid Caesar and, uh, who am I missing? Oh, Carl Reiner. It's based on their skit, The Three Haircuts. Uh, and oh. that is exactly <laughs> Howie Morris. Uh, he does his shtick as Jet Screamer as one of the members of The Three Haircuts. What is The Three Haircuts? I'm so confused. <laughs> it's kind of like, a, it, it's like on. a boy band from the 50s that have hair and just, just do everything way over the top. Uh, yeah, I was trying to look. I was like, what Ed Sullivan show appearance is this? But it's too yeah, early. No, nope, it's a couple it, of years it is before. It's a skit from your show of shows and, called wow. Three Haircuts. Yeah. Huh. There was this, like, I, you know, I'm watching this again. It, things are always different when you see them on the big screen. I've been watching this on my computer before. And just the extent to which George Jetson is, like, this, like, falling down Michael Douglas, like, angry white man throughout <laughs> yeah. the episode. And the extent to which, at the end, through this, like, kind of, like, you know, this sort of artistic like explosion, flowering, all of these abstract, uh, you know, expressionistic shapes and, and abs you know, all this abstraction, you, you get to this magical generational reconciliation at the end. I thought it was just like such an odd moment of like, your dad thinks something's cool. And so you're like, yeah, that's great. Like, I think my, my dad likes the music I like, which is like your worst nightmare as a teenager. <laughs> There's just something like very kind of like almost, ma almost a magical realism moment where it was like, this is just something that does not happen. Like this I mean, kind it's, of it's, it's, it's certainly of, uh, It's certainly a turn and you don't, he never plays the drums in any other episode, but I always wonder and maybe beep and I, and I haven't, I mean, I watched the Jetsons every episode 10 times growing up because of, it was always uh, in reruns, but I don't re. I wonder if people, you know, know if, is he angrier in this episode in the pilot than he is yeah. uh, in the first season, and then it comes back in 1978, 79 you know, there, for another. There was the episodes. archetype of the angry father in so many things in those days, and I don't know if it was a post-war uh, kind of idea of maybe, oh, um, oh, who, you know, who was the. Um, Oh, the uh, large man. Who? Jackie Gleason. Jackie Gleason. Yeah, the honeymooners. The honeymooners. They're, and, uh, Ricky and Lucy. Ricky was always a little, you know, on the edge. And there, there was always a, a kind of an archetype of a, of a father that was a complaint oriented uh, person. It was a little different than what we end up seeing. Incidentally, this particular episode of The Jetsons. I remember it. You were talking about the first ones being smarter. I remember it when it showed, and maybe it's that eep, op, or ah, uh, ah, uh, you know, sort of thing, which, which absolutely was bye bye birdie. It just later, you know, it just came alive as in, in, in that sense. But something about it was profound because it, it, it took language away. It was just devolving language. It was taking words, making them into this song, and finally it was music that connected the father and everybody. It was art uh, that did something as opposed to the, the language that you think would have been the solution mode. There's yeah. something that feels very mythological about that mm -hmm. episode. If you actually like don't see it as a farce, it actually has this like kind of deep structure to it, mm -hmm. which I did not expect to, to see in this episode, which feels very much like a classic sitcom setup. Um, <laughs> Well, we only, I, you know, I want to shift to, to questions. I want to ask you all one more question. Do you want to talk about poetry and animation, or do you want to talk about why these characters are so culturally durable and why so many people came out tonight? You know, I, I think poetry <laughs> is a curious connection to all of this. If you think of poetry as a kind of distillation to moment, so often what, what cartoons do is they rely on their moments. They don't really rely on their narrative. The narrative is almost a, just a, a, a coat you throw onto the thing. Because the story is kind of silly, it's like opera, right? It's 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 not opera. It's the 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 hard held note that is unforgettable in the moment in which it is sung, and that you are there present to witness it. 
And something about cartoons gave us that sense of moment. I don't think it did a lot for storytelling. <laughs> We have like a night with phones. I don't, I don't think uh, cartoons do a lot for storytelling, but bit by bit, if we, if we want to call them bits, that, that probably would be a, not a great comparison to what a poem does, but a poem lives by its moments and not, not by its narrative. And I think that's what we see often in poetry. We remember bits out of them. We remember moments out of them. And I'm not sure we remember over the overarching uh, narrative story so much. Kevin, do you want to yeah, take I'll us just, out with? Yeah, I'll just you know echo that and and the thing about um, you know with, with Hanna Barbera and why they remained so in, in uh, so popular endured for for so long among among many reasons is that a lot of people are putting money other other studios are putting money into stories. Okay, okay, you just look at something like Beanie and Cecil; they put money into stories. Uh, Anna Barbera was, was less concerned, per se, with story. Uh, they were more concerned with those things that you can recall easily. Mm -hmm. And that's where the money went in. They went into, they got Warner Brothers' top gag men. So they were into gags. That was memorable. They were into theme songs. Like, you always remember their theme songs. And they paid for, <laughs> as, as, as you can share. <laughs> <laughs> and they pay top do dollar for voice talent. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is Dawes Butler who plays. And the one thing that the Dawes Butler uh, was the original Huck voice Sorry. Of, of, from Huckleberry Hound. Yeah. Uh, was the voice of Huckleberry Hound. He was the original voice of the Time for Beanie uh, puppet show from Robert Clampett, in which the cartoon was based on. Uh, Dawes Butler is the voice of Elroy. Dawes Butler is the voice of... Uh, of um, Quick Draw McGraw. He's the voice of Yogi Bear. He is the voice of a lot of people, including my favorite, Scooby Dumb. Uh, I mean, one of the things. Uh, so it's kind of those things that, you know, led uh, Hanna Barbera to be quite dominating in a way and quite memorable, uh, particularly if you're a young kid, you know, who, wa who just wants to watch cartoons. And wants to laugh and smile yeah. and, and and just see the same thing again and again because it provides this kind of sense of pleasure and understanding and mem of memory and, and so on and so forth. So that is uh, kind of what Hanna Barbera did in a way that other people did. I love that. All right. Well, uh, at this point, I think we're going to go and take a few questions. So, uh, Alicia. <laughs> Uh, on the on this side and Cody on this side are, are are around with microphones and if you raise your hand they'll come over to you and uh, love to hear what you think or if you have questions for uh, for our, our guests. Hello. Wow. That's loud. <laughs> Modify my voice out here. Um, one of the things that, that struck me in pointing this out, sort of asking about cultural references, is that the Jetsons episode is sixty two. 62. 62. Yep. So there's a period in pop music history between 59 and 64 where rock music had sort of, was sort of being culturally dismissed as a fad that had gone away. And there's this moment in between where you get this kind of softer, jazzier rock music that, that was a lot of people thought was more generationally friendly in between the two of them. Uh, I'd seen, I've seen this episode a thousand times. I always thought it ripped off the, uh, the Flintstones episode, the Twitch, but I just looked up the dates and the Twitch episode actually aired two weeks after this. Oh, wow. So there's something in the zeitgeist about, uh, you know, Elvis gone away to war, Bye Bye Birdie, and this kind of softening of rock music that held this sort of possibility that until the Beatles came along, there was this kind of possibility that that, that sort of angry, youthful rock had passed and, and, and the, the teenagers were now going to start accepting their parents' music and vice versa. <laughs> so this, this, this sort of occurs in that moment that where you know, the, the music had died, so to speak, and we're in this, this sort of place of possible reconciliation. From a historical perspective, we don't see that because we know what happened for the rest of the 60s. Um, but in this sort of early optimistic, you know, early Kennedy era moment, we get that sense of potential optimism, the possibility of the space race. Yes, the Cold War is going on, but it's pre-Cuban Missile Crisis. It's pre the idea that you know we're headed towards this 
chaotic apocalypse. And I, I, that, that sort of really came, that really comes out in the figure of Judy here in particular, who's willing to accept her father once he accepts her music. So I have no question, but that's my... You, 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 say, you use a very useful phrase, though, Kennedy era. Yeah. And that, that optimism is the Jetsons in so many ways, even though we see the Jetsons as a futuristic sort of thing. It says, if we land on the moon, boy, we can do anything. Yes. No, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a good thing, because Hanna Bar interesting, because Hanna-Barbera at the moment is um, not, it's not simply tapping into it in, in those two cartoons, but they have two strands of consumer product um, that have emerged at this time. That they're, uh, and that one is the toys, in which, but the other is that they set up uh, not only their own label later, but prior uh, with Colpix, but with Hanna-Barbera Records. Uh, it's kind of four or five year period uh, at the time to you know, kind of extend their brand with this kind of music that you're talking about. There's certainly... Uh, Fan favorites because sometimes they have the uh, sometimes they have some really good original music. Other times they have the original voices, but they don't have the original voices, and so on. But it's kind of this interesting kind of you know kind of thing that people have forgotten about Hanna Barbera, uh, at least their entryway into music in the early '60s, uh, and that was prior to everybody tapping into bubblegum at the late '60s with the success of of the monkeys in the Archie that they participated in. Now go ahead, just go, one, that uh, particular episode two of the Jetsons where it's that <coughs> oop or whatever. I don't know how many <laughs> of you remember uh, the song Witch Doctor. <laughs> My friend the Witch Doctor, he told me what to do. Ooh ee, ooh ah ah, walla walla bing bang. Oh. Oh. All of them, all of them, which were language riffs. They were, they were jazz words, yeah. right? And, and it was a search for something more than what words were giving us up to now. And, and, and you, see, you see it in that episode of just trying to, you know, it, and, and remember, they say it's a secret code also. It actually means something. And he wink, wink, meet me later, you know, baby, 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 right? <laughs> we, we know it means something, but all things mean something. And, and I love that idea that they were pushing words around. You were talking about poetry. You, you see that in action right there. They're, they're moving these words and trying to make them become meaningful constructs in and of themselves, even though they don't seem to make any sense. That's it. All of it. The fugs, all of them. <laughs> all right, back here. Uh, yes, I, I saw a lot of these firsthand, too. I don't know how many people there are, but I, I think I in my back of my mind, I do know hearing the very first time that ooh ee bop bop song, yeah, song yeah. stuck in my head. But uh, there were a lot of things from that time that I really liked. One of them, especially since you're talking about space, I thought you would be, you would have thrown in, it wasn't uh, animation, it was puppets, but Fireball XL5 <laughs> was a very interesting and very different kind of show. There are some episodes on YouTube, they hold up tolerably well, but uh, I was wondering if any of you had, had any experience with that. I don't know the. Uh, yeah, I um, I have not uh, you know you know done that because that's uh, Jerry Anderson, uh, correct? And uh, and I spe and I've kind of examined the you know American kind of children's television, uh, and I've, and I and I didn't explore kind of the British context for the production, but I know it came over here along with some Japanimation. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it's definitely British, and you could. Yeah. It definitely had the British feel to it, but it did come here. Yeah, no, no. And, and, I remember and it as a kid. It really. I've stuck met in, you. Stuck I have. I've had the DVDs for a while, and I just have never gone to them. Uh, <coughs> well, I, I, it holds up tolerably well. Although I think the best one that holds up still is Rocky and Bullwinkle. Those are still very, very good. Even <coughs> They're my favorite. Wasamata you, right? <laughs> Uh, other folks with questions? Yeah, there's one uh, up here, Cody, and then uh, Alicia right here, gentleman in the hat. Mm -hmm. So we'll we'll start with uh, on Cody's side, if that's okay. Kind of go back and forth. Hi. Uh, yeah, we're here. Okay, we're good. Everybody here. 
Uh, the, the Beanie and Cecil episode, I'm glad that you mentioned Rocky and Bullwinkle because I remember very well. It was a fractured fairy tales. They did Sleeping Beauty and they also ragged on Disney because he had turned Sleeping Beauty into a Disneyland park and charged everybody for tickets and all that. Um, so that was derivative. I checked the dates on it. Both episodes were actually pretty contemporaneous. They were both 1960. Uh, my, my hard question is uh, the Huckleberry Hound episode, it, it, is it intentionally anti-authoritarian because it's showing a... a a policeman, an authority figure, who's oblivious to the dangers of a technologically advanced alien. So, I mean, how subversive was the show, given that this was 1960, and the kids that were watching this stuff grew up and would take to the streets in the late 60s? You know, if, I, if I had to just make a generalized uh, uh, statement about that, Huckleberry Hound, throughout all of the episodes that he was in, just always went his own way. Whatever, he was wearing something different each day. Couldn't hold a job, apparently, right? <laughs> He was always something different, and, and that's what I, I remember thinking. I liked that. He was trying out all sorts of things. Was that anti-authoritarian? Sure it was. Um, he traveled amongst uh, the masses. He was never the leader. Or, he wasn't Sarge, right? And, and so the, it, every, every uh, uh, weight marker that, that he has, he's always the working person. And there's, uh, if, if you know Latin American cinema, he was always kind of a cantinflas uh, character, where you know the the, the comeuppance it wasn't dramatic, but he he would always um, come out not ahead, but okay. You knew he'd be back because he had been so many places. Yeah, there's I I feel like there's this symbolic kind of rightness of that character for the moment, where he's this like more kind of flexible, come as you are, you know, come what may kind of kind of person that's more suited for turbulent times. I think there's a, a sort of tacit argument in there about, the other thing it reminds me of is the, the I'm gonna mispronounce this because I don't do French well, but Flunder, like the, this character of like, uh, and this is from French kind of philosophy and, and intellectual culture, this person who sort of walks the streets of the city and encounters the city on its own terms and sees the flowering of possibility. Uh, the surrealists were really into this idea. They called it objective chance. The city would give you what you needed at the given moment to solve the problem you had or to give you a new experience. And this character is that kind of like wanderer who sort of mm -hmm. meets things as they are and doesn't impose a rigid system. If you compare him to someone like George Jetson as a main character, I mean, that's someone with a rigid set of rules and expectations. And, and he changes, but it's like he has to, there has to be a revision there. And with Huckleberry Hound, there's kind of a, I don't know, there's a more of a fluidity to the, what the character expects out of life, I think. Almost, don't worry, be happy. Yeah, he just exactly. sort of, he just wanders through it all, and uh, so you start having faith that he will continue to wander through it all. His, uh, it, it's a kind of innocence. I mean, he, uh, they were playing with his, um, his accent there, and he was going, I gots to get my whatever, you know, he's just, just these, that I don't think he has later. So I think they change a little bit of his language. I don't know if that's accurate or not. But, but he seems to, to weather it, which is an optimistic uh, sensibility. He weathers it. He goes through it, but he doesn't weather it from the top down. He, he, it's from the bottom up. You know, or not even up. It's just the bottom. He's just there. and It's okay. He'll be, he'll be okay. He's also not a trickster, which I think is interesting. So At the all. last time Kevin and I did one of these events together, it was we, did, we looked at Warner Brothers. We did mm -hmm. Bugs Bunny. Bugs Bunny's like always smarter than everybody else. That's mm -hmm. the basic premise of that mm -hmm. character. And this character's not. He's not smart. No, but, he, but he's, like you said, he survives. Yeah. You know, he gets yeah. through. Um, and it's a, there's a, this laconic And interestingly, he doesn't, he doesn't, I mean, he gets through and he's earnest. He is working. He's doing what he's supposed to be doing. He's not slacking off. He's yeah. not just like sitting in the corner. He's actually trying to do what he's supposed to be doing. Just can't always make it work. Right? <laughs> it's funny because I'm, I'm quiet because I don't know Huckleberry Hound very well. So, you know... His character, uh, you know, you know, became was not then supplanted by Yogi Bear, who seems to be uh, maybe somebody more active, mm. you know, rather than things maybe being done to them. Uh, that you know, Huckleberry Hound was not somebody who you were very familiar with. At least you knew his voice, you knew his face. He was part of a menagerie of Hanna Barbera characters but in the 70s he was you know he, he was not there i mean yogi yogi bear you know was part of the laugh olympics there was yogi bear space race yogi uh, yogi bears uh and arc yogi's arc 
lots of and of, of some of these characters. Snagglepuss appeared, you know, a little bit later. Um, but but Huckleberry Hound, um, however, he representative of that moment of, of what you know, with what you guys are making sense, somehow did not transfer to either a 1970s mentality or to something that was suitable for Saturday morning viewership. Something else that speaks to the optimism of Huckleberry Hound, by the way. If you heard him sing the song, which he sang, he sings at some point in every show, Oh, my darling, oh, my darling, oh, my darling Clementine, la, 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 da, da, da. He never remembers the part that she dies <laughs> and drowns. He just doesn't, he doesn't have words for it. He just sings the, he just sings the happy, happy part of it. And, and there's some clue to his character in that, you know, that he... It slips his mind that she drowns and that she has big feet. And, and what is other the movie things? in which the robbers are wearing the Huckleberry Hound mask? Oh. That, I th I, I'm thinking, is it, is it Point Break? Oh, oh, I don't know. I thought that was Dead Presidents. That was a bunch was of presidents. No, no, sorry. It's a bunch of presidents. In, okay, is in it. Point Break. We're not getting into that. <laughs> is it, is, something, in, the is there something in, in Bonnie here, and guys. Clyde with Huckleberry Hound, Matt? No, it wouldn't be. Of course not. Uh, there's something in which that uh, I, I, I'll have to look it up. Uh, Some homework for everyone. Yeah. Uh, we did have another question on this side, mm -hmm. I believe. Yes, sir. Hi, I was wondering if you could comment on the current state of Saturday morning cartoons. Uh, I mean, I listened uh -huh. to you speak about how impactful they've been on you. I mean, some of these cartoons are... 50 years old. I've watched Saturday morning cartoons and I've watched kids be just as enthralled with them as they were when I was a boy. But there's something, from my perspective, there's something missing from it. I don't see the children today talking about the cartoons that are on TV now 30 years from now the way that you guys are talking about the cartoons that you grew up watching. Well, it was the only game in town. Uh, you know, so Disney was you know, had, there was very few feature length films. Um, there was Saturday morning and some stuff after school. There was no cable television. It was just Saturday morning. I mean, so the category, when people saw it, when you said Saturday morning cartoons, it, it, it represented something that was quite precious and unique for many years. I mean, now there's no such thing as Saturday morning. The last network Saturday morning block aired, I think it was seven years ago or something, and you can see the final Saturday morning cartoon, you know, kind of ended, because now, obviously, uh, you can watch things at almost at any hour, uh, you, can, you know, there's Netflix, but, you, you know, things, you had cartoon, you had a whole network dedicated to cartoons, whether it's Cartoon Network or Boomerang and Mornings and so on, so that kind of really special time in which it was just yours, mom and dad were still sleeping, you went downstairs, things started at 8 o'clock, and you would watch it until uh, they got up. It was wonderful. I mean, the greatest, the greatest thing I remember as a kid was not just Saturday morning. I was born two months before Scooby-Doo premiered. I had Scooby-Doo with the stuffed animal in my crib, and, <laughs> and, and that's partly of why I'm writing a book on Scooby-Doo, but was the fall season preview it was like, oh, yeah. what's the new cartoons going to be on? And it was this prime time, 8 o'clock, maybe September 7th on some day, and you would see. Because you didn't know anything what was coming, but it's like, oh, my God, this new Scooby-Doo. Or, oh, oh, wow, this new Scooby-Doo clone. And then, oh, there's the Osmonds, the Partridge family in, what is it, 2400 AD or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, you know, that it was really special. So... Uh, you know, from so set, so looking back on those days, I don't sit and watch reruns if I don't have to of those cartoons. I watch reruns or uh, of the Looney Tunes stuff that was made for adults for theatrical release in the 30s, in the 40s, and 50s. I watch you know cartoons that you know from Adult Swim or from the USA Network when you know they had some kind of unique stuff. Or I watch Cartoon Network shows, but I don't return to this moment except for kind of, oh, this is really nostalgic because it just doesn't lend the pleasures anymore as adult as it did for a kid. How about you? I, I love, I do like watching Rocky and Bullwinkle when I get the chance. So I do return to some of this. Um, but I, 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 I'm a, I agree with you. So much of what, when I tune in like on a Saturday morning, and as you're saying, it, it, Saturday morning is any morning. 
because everything is everywhere, right? Cable, TV, and everything else. Uh, I can't see the focus anymore. I can't see the, the sensibility. I can't see the singular voice that's, that's speaking to a kid sitting there watching that, that show. I, I don't see it. And that, that has diffused something that felt very sharp to me when I was a kid. I was being, some, some, I was being you know, not talked to. I was, it, that show was for me. And now it doesn't, I don't have that feeling. The, I mean, I do think, like, speaking as the much younger person here, like, this, there is a sort of shattering and fragmentation of the culture that it's hard not to be nostalgic about a moment where there was more unanimity about people's awareness of these shows. Uh, you know, I just recently became aware of a cartoon called Steven Universe, which is, like, really good. I've got to say, for those of you who are, like, in, you know, searching for a cartoon that was made in the last 50 years, that's good. It's really great. It's very like diverse and inclusive. It's really well written, and it's created by a, a young woman who who pretty much works on her own. I think. I mean, there's a team, of course, but there's a sort of sole creative voice. It's very interesting. It's a different model than they're using here, but um, I do want to say, and I like some MTV cartoons from the '90s. For those of you who are in my age cohort, um, liquid television cartoons. We were talking about yesterday a little bit. Um, so I don't know. I do think it's still there, but I I do think there's. It's, it's so much harder to have a conversation and to throw around references with people you don't know very well. And I think it's very, it's a totally different mode of kind of reception and engagement of c pop culture. And, you know, we could talk for two hours. About it, that, it, it, it is hard, too, because it, it, you, you don't know whether to confuse nostalgia and how you, how you loved it with how it actually, you know, holds up. I was talking to a group of freshmen today, a large group, and I was talking about Huckleberry Hound. And it was total silence. <laughs> they had no idea. They never heard of Huckleberry Hound, didn't know who he was, had no particular, didn't know how to even connect to it. So I don't know if it's nostalgia that takes me backward and says that was good and I'm just a crack, crotchety old man or something, and, you know, or, or whether it was accurately so that those were just good shows. Uh, personally, I think they were, but I don't know that we can get, we can't be young like that again and be in that moment again. So we, like Huckleberry Hound, have to take the moment as it comes. And I think just uh, in this age of dispersed and spreadable media, for those, you know, because, you know, I did not have, and there was Rocky and Bullwinkle, but it wasn't as, as certainly as present. There wasn't definitely Beanie and Cecil. I mean, there was uh, the Saturday morning uh, that, you know, it was our space. You know, it was kids' space. Mm -hmm. It was just for us. That's Nobody true. else. And the thing was, everybody, all the other kids everywhere were sharing the same experience. We weren't in, in little kind of, 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 of silos or unique type sites of taste cultures. Or uh, it was everybody sharing the same experience, you know, pretty much at the same moment, depending on, t on, on time zones. Uh, and so, you know, it, it, it was, later on it became different, you know, but certainly for me, I mean, you shared this knowledge and everybody had this knowledge. So when you look back, everybody has the same experience. There wasn't kind of pick and choosing all these, all these kinds of networks, you know, all these different types of platforms. There was just TV. And, 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 and so everybody had the same thing, same experience. And it was our own experience because at that time, in addition to what I just said, is that total audiences were what advertisers were basing ad rates on. But it wasn't until Saturday morning in the late 60s that they base ad rates on just the kids watching in the morning. And so it just became that was our space because the primetime syndicated space for the most part was either for housewives and then families or just adults because kids did not count really into that total audience for advertisers. But they did and they mattered and the shows were targeted to us only on Saturday morning. And then they got you to start sending your dimes in. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and I have to, I have to sadly uh, uh, wrap us up there. Thank you both so much for, for being here with us. Please give them Thank a Thank you, Joy. Applause.